welcome. Um, today we're going to talk about lines, we're going to talk about quadratic functions, we're going to talk about a couple more functions. Uh, then we're going to discuss trigonometry, and um, we might go into inverse functions um, depending on the time. Um, but first, we'll talk about lines. So a line is defined by two things, a slope and a point. Uh, so let's draw a line first. The line on the Cartesian plane looks like that, it's a line. And the slope is the direction that the line goes in. And you can see, you know, there's that line, there are, there's an infinite number of lines with the same slope, they're all parallel. So we also need a point to fix where the line is. Um, so the direction of the line, uh, to define the direction of the line, we're going to take two points on that line. Uh, let's call them, uh, I should label it above. Let's call them x1. Um, is this large enough for people to see? Maybe I should draw it a little larger. Oh, I should also mention, if you do have a question, um, you don't have to raise your hand or anything. You could just uh, ask the question. So we have a line, and we're going to pick two points on the line in order to define its direction. We'll call the first one x1, y1. We'll call the second one x2, y2. So we have two x. Uh, values and two y values. Now, to define the direction these go, and I'm going to, well, there are a few different ways you can do it. I'm going to draw a right triangle connecting these points. Because given two points, between those two points, there's some horizontal change and there's some vertical change. The horizontal change we can call a change in x vertical change, we can call a change in y, delta y, delta x. And the direction that a line goes in, we're going to call the slope. So we'll say the slope, I'll say in parentheses, of a line equals the height change divided by the uh, horizontal change, the vertical change divided by the horizontal change. It is how much the line goes up for each unit it goes forward. So the change in the height, delta y, divided by the uh, horizontal change, um, the change in x. And with these two points chosen, the change in y can be written in terms of those two points, one minus the other. So here I'll write y2 first, um, y2 minus y1 divided by the x change, x2 minus x1. And a large part of calculus involves the slope of lines. Now, they're not going to be in exactly this context where we take two points in order to find the slope. Um, as we uh, go on in the semester, we will see other ways to find slopes of relevant lines. Um, any questions about defining the uh, slope of the line? Um, I should also mention, if you type a question, um, are there any aspects of, where is that found? So, yeah, um, if you type a question, odds are I won't see it as you type it because uh, the computer's over there and I'm over here. Um, so if you do have a question, just feel free to, you know, ask it out loud uh, whenever. Um, let's look at an example. Well, actually, let's not look at an example yet. Let's define this uh, in terms of one letter. It's slope, it's standard to just call the lowercase m. So at the end, I'll just say equals a lowercase m. Um, and we'll use lowercase m a few times throughout the semester. Um, but let's just look at an example, uh, how much board space do I have? Okay. Example. Find slope of the line. So a point 
and a slope define a line. You could also define a line using two points and just drawing a line between. So find the slope of the line containing the points. Uh, which two did I write down here? Three negative two. Let's write negative two. Three negative two and uh, negative five. We'll find the slope. We need the, uh, the number for the second point, the second, the y value, it's not in the shot. Well, yes, you're correct. I guess it's in the shot. Uh, uh, I forgot what it was. Negative five, one. Nah. Okay, negative five, one. I went through trouble drawing that line at the top right at the beginning, and I didn't pay attention to it. Okay, find the slope. It's showing now, correct? Find the slope yeah. of the line containing the points three, negative two, and negative five, one. Well, we need the height change, the uh, you know the, the vertical change divided by a horizontal change, or we could follow that formula. So we'll say m equals. So in this equation, you know, you could write y one first, y two second, x one first, x two second, if you want, um, as long as you're starting at one point and ending at the other. So here, I'm just gonna uh, I'll write this one first, I guess. Negative two minus that y value, so minus one over that x value, three minus a negative five, minus negative five becomes a positive five. So on top we have negative three, and on the bottom three plus five is eight. Negative three eighths. Any questions about that? So you know, we're going to see in this semester some other ways of finding slopes of relevant lines. Um, usually in a calculus class, you have a blend of people who have seen some calculus before and some who have not. Um, so some of you might have an idea what we're going to get to in week, end of week two, beginning of week three. Um, but for now, the slope will just be a height change divided by a vertical change. Now, another useful thing in calculus is finding equations for a line. And there are a few different equations for a line, a few different ways you could write the equation of a line. Um, in calculus, one is much more useful than the others. There's a standard form, a slope intercept form, and a point slope form. In calculus, the point slope form is gonna be much easier to deal with, easier to find. So how can we find that? Well, we'll take our same line. I guess I'll erase this. Let's say equation for uh, I will take a line, and instead of picking two points on the line, I'm just going to pick one point on the line. I'm going to fix one point on the line, another x1, y1 on that line. Uh, is there a glare on the left half of what I'm writing? I'm just looking at the screen, and it looks a lot. No. Yeah? No. I'm going to close a curtain here. Uh, I think that might be because of curtain. So let's see if this makes any difference. I think it was a curtain. So we're going to pick one point on the line. We'll call it x1, y1. And Instead of picking another point on the line, this is too close to the title I wrote. Pick a 
point called x1, y1. Instead of picking another point on the line, we're going to pick a variable on this line. So we're going to choose another point, but we're going to let that vary on the line, meaning it will be defined by variables at x and y. So I'll say a variable point on the line. So we have a fixed point on the line, and then we're going to let this other point vary on the line. Well, given this, we can still find the slope. And notice this slope, uh, so I'll say slope. Well, I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to say m slope equals still the change in y over the change in x. To write the variable point first in this case. Slope is still the change in y over the change in x, but notice now this is a function with x and y. So we could write this x in terms of y, or we could write y in terms of x. It's standard to write um, y in terms of x. So um, let's do that. How do we do that? Well, we can get rid of this fraction. Um, so I'll just say, so solve that. Well, let's just uh, reduce the fraction, not reduce, um, eliminate the fraction. That's the word. We do that, multiply both sides by the denominator. You multiply that side by the denominator. You're left with y minus y1. You multiply the left side by the denominator. You get m times x minus x1. So all we did here was take this slope equation and get rid of the fraction by multiplying by the denominator. And you could, well, put a square around this or a rectangle. Um, any questions about getting that? Now you could, you know, this y1 is a constant, it's a fixed point on the line. So you could add this to both sides, distribute the m and so on and it would give you the slope intercept form, but I'm gonna leave it here at the point slope form. Right here, we have the point slope form of a line. Why is it called point slope? Well, the fixed values in here are the slope m and the point x1, y1, and our variables are X and Y. Any questions about finding that equation? Where's my place here? So this example, let's uh, change it to find an equation for the line containing these points. Um, find an equation for the line containing these points and uh, I'd like to write over here but I can't um and I'm gonna do the work over here because um, the way I usually organize this requires more room than I have over there so example, find an equation for the line containing the points. Well, if we're using the point slope of, uh, form of the line, which we should get used to. In calculus, one of the things we're gonna do is find equations of certain lines. And a point will generally be given. And we're gonna see ways we can find the relevant slope. So when we need an equation for the line, calculus is gonna give us the slope and because of that, the point slope form is much more convenient. Um, so the way I always like to organize a question where it says find an equation for a line, I like to immediately start by observing we need a point and a slope. We need a point and a slope. Well, the previous example gave us the slope. 
negative three eighths. And right here, we're given two points. All we need is one of those two points. You can choose whichever one you want. I'll choose the one that's written first. We need an equation for a line. We need a point and a slope. And from there, we can find an equation for the line by using the point slope form. Point slope form, y minus the y value. Um, y minus, in this case, negative two, y minus negative two is the same as y plus two, equals the slope negative three eighths times x minus the x value, x minus three. And don't have to take the time to simplify that. And you can see if you just did want to simplify this, you can distribute the three eighths, negative three eighths, uh, distribute that here, subtract the two. Um, it would give you the slope intercept form, but um, Point slope forms. Any questions about that? Hi, um, I have a question. Yes. Um, I was wondering, um, the, like you give us the point, I mean the point slope form of a line. Can we still use y equals mx plus b, or we um, we have to use that one? If you wanted to distribute this through. That times that is positive nine eighths. Three eight, negative three eighths times negative three, positive nine eighths. Subtract two gives you positive one eighth if you wanted to. But um, finding the well, the reason a slope intercept form is useful is because it tells you how you can graph the line. You know, by taking the y-intercept and then taking a direction. In this case, I guess it's negative slope. Um, in this class, we're not going to do much of graphing specific lines. And because of that, the y-intercept, well, because of that, the slope-intercept form isn't necessary. But it's also, the computation to find the y-intercept is, well, it can get pretty inconvenient. Um, so I would always, you know, in a calculus class, recommend just stopping at the, the point slope form. Um, slope um, but if you wanted to solve that for y, distribute, subtract two, uh, you could. Uh, any other questions about uh, that? Um, so we just looked at an equation for a line, and actually I have this one written here in this form. Notice it's written in the form y equals something times x and other numbers all over the place. But in particular, this is just an x to the first power. A function which can be written as y equals something with x to the first is always going to be a line, but it's a special case of a more general function called a polynomial. Um, lines have x to the first. Um, the next polynomial that we're going to look, the next kind of polynomial we're going to look at is a quadratic function, which is a degree two polynomial. So I'll say quadratic functions. That's this degree two polynomials. And uh, at the beginning, when I wrote lines, you could have written degree one polynomials after. Um, you'll see some of these. Um, well, some of these will show up as we do calculus. Um, so here, I'm just going to. Uh, introduce these a little. Um, a general form of a quadratic function is 
is y equals a x squared plus b x plus c, where a, b, and c are numbers, and x is our variable. Notice the largest exponent on the x's is two. So we have an x squared and x to the first and our constant. Um, and there are, in general, there are many things you can do with um, degree two functions. We're gonna do a couple things with them. We're gonna sketch them using graph transformations, and we're also going to find their roots. Uh, so which one should we do first? In my notes, I wrote sketch first, so I guess we'll sketch them first. Uh, what numbers should I have written? One, negative four, and nine. Um, a degree two function is always going to be, well, it's always going to look like that shifted around or like that upside down shifted around. And we're going to see how it gets shifted around with this example. Uh, where should I start? Right here is what it is. Actually, I'm going to erase this title because I won't have room over here. Write this at the top of the board. Sketch, and I'll say using graph transformations. using graph transformations, uh, this function y equals x squared minus 4x plus 9. And right now, so if you haven't watched the first video, we do talk about graph transformations, but if you haven't watched it, um, it'll be okay for uh, this discussion. If you have watched it, maybe this discussion will make uh, that discussion more clear. Um, but right now, this isn't written in a form that we can sketch the function using graph transformation. But what we can do is force it to be in that form by completing the square. So we can complete the square in order to write it in a form that we can graph using graph transformations. Now, what does this mean, complete the square? Well, uh, let's write it right here. This board isn't tall enough. Well, okay. So we'll start with our function. I'm not gonna write the plus nine yet. What does completing the square mean? Well, it means we're going to write the x's in a single square. But to do that, we're going to add zero. Now, if we add zero, it's not going to change this function. This plus zero is itself. But we're going to add a convenient zero that allows us to write the x's here in a perfect square. Now, which convenient zero will we add? Um, so you know how for the organizational purposes, I'm going to write something else over here. Um, but which zero will we add? Well, we look at the coefficient on x, negative four. Take the coefficient on x, which is negative four. Divide it by two. Divide it by two and square. So take the coefficient on x, negative four, divide it in two and square. And what do we get? Well, negative four divided by two is negative two. Negative two squared equals four. So take this coefficient, negative four divided by two and square. And what are we gonna do with that? Well, we're gonna take this number four, we're gonna put it, uh, I should probably put a plus, multiplying, 
take that number, which is four, we're going to add it. We can't change the function. So if we add it, we also need to subtract it. Now, right now, what's underlined adds to zero. So this equation is the same as the equation we started with. Any questions about finding that four? So why did we do this? Well, now this line has, well, it has five different pieces. The first three of them, I have another color, let's underline the first three, I guess. First three of them, the colors show up. Yeah, it looks like they do. Uh, the first three can now be written as a square. x minus 2 squared. This quantity all squared simplifies to x squared minus 4x plus 4. Or another way you could observe it is that this negative 2 here shows up in our computation um, from down there. The first three can be written as a square. And then the last two are just numbers. Negative 4 plus 9 is what, 5? So that original function can be rewritten in this form. Any questions about finding that? Um, how did you get the five? The five? Uh, so these first three became the square, and we were left with, oh, this is going to be a lot of underlines. Uh, I'll put a circle instead. We're left with negative four plus nine, which adds to five. Oh. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, and when I complete the square, this underlying term, I do always write the positive one first and then the negative one second um, because of the next simplification. The positive is going to go with that, and the negative will go with this one. Um, any other questions about finding that? So, well, we didn't answer the question, we just rewrote the equation. But now this equation, a, a graph of this function can be found using graph transformation. So I'm just gonna rewrite that up here. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you saw the function video, then you know what that means. If you didn't, well, I'll explain it briefly right here. We can sketch this curve by starting with a basic curve. Uh, I'm going to draw that lower. Right here, we have y equals something with x's squared and other numbers written around it. So if you essentially ignore the 2 and the 5, we have an x squared function. And it's written in this form we can find its sketch using graph transformations by starting with just y equals x squared, which looks like this. So we can start with just y equals x squared with no numbers in the way, and then interpret those numbers accordingly. Well, on this function, y equals x squared, uh, for one of these sketches, I like to keep track of, in this case, the point that goes through zero, zero. Um, so that's what I'm going to uh, keep track of. The first thing that happens to x is this negative 2. So next, we're going to sketch y equals x with a negative 2 squared. Now, what does that do? Well, um, in the textbook, I believe it's in section 1.2. There's a page with a large table of graph transformations. Um, I find that hard to, hard to remember, a list of 30 rules. Um, but what I like to do is observe what happens to this point zero, zero. This point zero, zero is where this x is zero, where what's inside the square is zero. Where is the inside of this square zero? Well, the inside of this square is now zero, at x equals 2. And that's going to cause this 
point to move over to x equals two. It causes a rightward shift. And the rest of the parabola drags over as well. Any questions about this first uh, transformation? Okay. And the last thing that happens to this is uh, the positive five. What does that do? Well, it takes all of these y values and adds five to them. So all of these y values go up five. So this point two zero, instead of being at two zero, it's going to go up to two five. And the rest of the parabola, I, this type of function could be called a parabola. Um, I think that might be the first time I used that word. Um, this uh, point goes up five units, and the rest of the function goes along with it. Any questions about this one? Um, so we can sketch these. There's this function, uh, you'll notice at the beginning it said x squared minus 4x plus 9. The coefficient on x squared was 1. Um, if the coefficient isn't 1, you can follow a similar process. Um, in terms of sketching them, you don't have to worry about that. I'm not going to ask about that for sketching. Um, but I could ask about that in another context. Um, but to get there, we need a definition. So I'll start that here. Definition. Um, X zero, lowercase x sub zero, is called a root. A zero of a function if f evaluated at that x zero value equals zero. So for our functions, we take x values, we throw them into our function, and they evaluate to something. A root will be if it evaluates to zero. Um, and what we're going to do next is find roots of quadratic functions. But before doing that, or uh, maybe after doing that, well, let's erase the board and then decide a little bit before or after. Uh, let's do it after. So let's find roots and then let's interpret them geometrically. Let's find roots of a uh, quadratic function. Yeah. Find roots of uh, each quadratic function. So A. Uh, f of x equals x squared minus 4x plus 3. Part b of x equals x squared minus 3x minus 10. Notice in parts a and b, uh, the coefficient on x squared is 1 in each case. I don't have one written without one, so I can make one. Part C, f of x equals 2x squared. Let's see, let's make it negative 3. And uh, let's make it positive 3, sorry. Does that work? Uh, this one might not work. I have to pick one that I don't have written down. Um, so 
sorry, make that a negative seven. I had a sign off. Sorry, a negative seven x. Two x squared minus seven x plus three. Um, well, how are we going to do this? Well, the definition of a root is an x value where f of x equals zero. So we need to set our function equal to zero and solve for x. Now, how can we solve this? Well, um, we can factor, well, we can complete the square in order to solve it. Um, I would not recommend that. That's generally a longer process than factor. Um, in this class, if you have to solve a degree two equal to zero, um, we're gonna see this probably, we're gonna see this show up in either four or five of our six weeks, maybe even all six of the weeks. Um, in every case, it will be factorable. Um, will be factorable. So how can we factor this? Well, the fact that that's a coefficient of one does help us, tells us that the only way x squared can split is as x and x. We need numbers which multiply to three, which add to negative four, negative three and negative one multiply to positive three and negative three minus one equals negative four. So if on this left side, you distribute everything through, it will equal that uh, equation up there because you'd have what X squared plus three, negative three X, negative one X, which make negative four X. And now to solve this, well, if you have two things multiplied together equaling zero, the only way that can happen is if one or the other or both are zero. So we have either the first thing equals zero or second thing equals zero. Add three gives you x equals three. Here, add one. So you get three or one. Um, solve that equation. Any questions about part A? Um, part B, uh, will that fit here? Yeah, I think it will fit here. What's our equation? X squared, we need the roots of this function. So we'll set this equal to zero. And again, this will factor. How does it factor? Well, we have just x squared in front, so that can only break down only in this way. x times x is x squared. We need numbers that add to negative 10 and add to, or sorry, that uh, multiply to negative 10 and add to negative 3. 5 and 2 make 10. 5 and 2 also make 3. Do the signs work? Well, if we take negative 5, and positive two, then negative five, positive two, multiply to negative 10, negative five X, positive two X, uh, that does give us our negative three X. And now we wanna solve this. Again, set this equal to zero, set that equal to zero. Um, you set the first one equal to zero, X minus five equals zero, add five, get X equals five. Set the second one equal to zero, what do you get? X plus two equals zero, subtract two, and you get X equals negative two. Any questions about that one? Um, now part C, more difficult than parts A and B because of that two in front. So how can we deal with this? Well, we need to solve this equation. 2x squared minus 7x plus 3 equals 0. 
Now, one convenience is the fact that uh, primes show up. When primes show up, it does make the factoring, well, it does restrict the choices of the factoring. Um, meaning here we have a two X squared. The only way two X squared can break into a product is with a two X and an X. Um, so that's one convenience. Now, we also need the rest to work out in this factory. Three, well, positive three, you can do what? A positive one times a positive three or a negative one times a negative three. It's also a prime, which is another convenience for us. Um, we have a negative seven, we're gonna need negatives. So here, I generally, like to make an intuitive guess and then check if the factoring works out. Does this work? Which one does? Does this work? Huh. I guess if I left it as negative five X, it would have worked fine too. That's interesting. Um, does this work for this uh, question? Well, uh, what happens if we multiply? You get 2x squared, that's good. You get positive 3, that's good. But what does, what is the coefficient on just x? On just x, you have negative 3 and a negative 2, which make negative 5. So this factoring doesn't work because we need it to be a negative 7, not a negative 5. So if that doesn't work, and there's only one other choice, then the other one should work. Uh, the other one should work. In this case, it will work. Uh, why will this work? Well, 2x times x does give us 2x squared. Negative 1 times negative 3 does give us positive 3. And in the middle, we have negative 6x and negative 1x, which, do give, which um, gives us our negative 7x. Any questions about that factoring? So now we need to solve this equation and that other equation. Um, set the first thing equal to zero. Set the second thing equal to zero. And this one add three to get x equals three. But over here, uh, we have two things to do. Add one x equals one divided by two, you get x equals a half. Any questions about that one? Um, I would imagine all of you have seen at some point the quadratic formula. Um, debating if I want to, you can if you want use it. Um, debating if I want to prove it. Uh, what time? We have one forty-seven on that clock. Um, later today, I might prove the quadratic formula. Um, but if you want to use it, you can. If not, um, they will all factor throughout the semester, they definitely will. Um, you know, this type of factoring where the number in front is not a one, it will show up a couple times, um, maybe four or five total times versus like 30 times for problems like A and B throughout the semester. Um, and if it does show up, it will factor almost every time this number in front will be a prime. Because um, I don't really like factoring these if it isn't a prime. But I'm pretty sure every semester I've done one example where it wasn't a prime, like in week three or four or something. Um, so solving these equations does show up frequently in calculus. Like right now, uh, this is just algebra, but some of the calculus we'll do will result in having to it result in our having to solve equations like those. Um, so it's definitely worth um, 
practice it. Um, so any questions about that? Um, we're going to talk about a couple more kinds of functions. Um, but before that, these roots have algebraic significance as illustrated in this example. Um, they also have geometric significance. Um, so I'm just going to write that as an observation. Um, observe. Um, I don't want to erase this. If f of x crosses, um, so I'm going to write a sentence here. But before doing that sentence, I'm going to draw a graph. So I don't just tell you what we're getting to. Let's build up to what we're getting to. What does a root look like? Well, a root in our definition I'll just say a root has an ordered pair. I'll order pair x value, y value. The root has x value according to our definition, x zero. But what's the y value um, from our root definition? The y value, it said f of x zero equals zero. So a root is always going to have ordered pair, whatever the x value is. Uh, and zero in the y value. What does that look like? Well, graph x zero zero. X zero goes over in the x direction. Let's say x zero is over there. Let's say it's positive for this. That the point on the plane with ordered pair x zero zero goes over x zero up zero. Since the y value is always going to be zero, a root of a function will correspond to a point where the function intersects the x axis. So if f of x crosses the x axis at x zero, then f of x has a root at, well, a root. Ah, uh, sorry, I should phrase this differently. Um, if f of x crosses the x-axis at x0, then x0 is a root. So if we have a function with x0 as a root, it could look something like something like this, I guess, where it goes through the x-axis at that point. Um, random function. Any questions about that? Um, so we've defined um, lines, we've defined quadratic functions. Um, we're going to see you know, a bunch of other kinds of functions. Uh, this semester. Uh, so let's define three more families of functions and discuss them. More functions. A polynomial has the form. Uh, it could say a polynomial is a function which has the form. I'll be a little informal. A polynomial has the form uh, f of x equals number times x to, to the n plus another number x to the n minus 1 all the way down to 
potentially a constant. So notice here, uh, maybe I should say a polynomial of degree n has this form. Polynomial degree n has the form. Now, what does this mean? Well, a n are all constants. So here, ignoring constants, we have x to the n plus x to the n minus one, all the way down to x to the first power and x to the zero power. Um, but each of those x terms can have a constant. So it's standard to write the polynomial a sub n x to the n, a sub n minus one x to the n minus one. Uh, just the, you know, these n's as the subscripts just label uh, potentially different constants. Um, so I'll, I'll write down here, remark. A line, a line is a polynomial where all you have are these last two terms. A line is a polynomial with degree one. Degree n polynomial, a line is degree one. And a quadratic function is a polynomial with degree two. And you know, degree three, degree four also have you know, certain words assigned to them. We're not going to really talk too much about that. If, what does that line say? What does that word say next uh, to a line? line? Do you mean what does this line say or what does it <laughs> The, the line, like the word next to, to the left of a line. Oh, this one? Yes. Remark. Remark. Okay. okay. What does that mean? Um, well, remark just means, you know, we've defined something up here, polynomial, and we're just going to elaborate a little on it. Okay. Um, so, yeah, in math, there are a lot of words we use for certain things. Um, you know, remark, observation. Um, okay. Yeah, this is just kind of combining this definition with something we've already seen. Lines and quadratic functions. Um, how would I phrase this here? Ah, a rational function. We have not seen a rational function yet. A rational function is of the form, well, f of x, standard for functions, equals p of x divided by q of x. I guess I do say where q is at zero, where p of x and q of x are polynomials. So polynomial is a long word. I'll just say poly, period. And you know, it's a rational number is a number which can be written as a fraction. A rational function is a fraction of polynomials. So um, if we're defining a fraction, the bottom can't be zero. So where p of x and q of x are polynomials, and q of x is not zero. Um, before talking a little bit about their property, let's define one more kind of function. a root function. It is of the form q 
we have polynomials with whole number, positive whole number exponents, a root function will be of the form x to the one over n, where n is anything larger than one. So if n equals two, you have x equals, or f of x is x to the one half, uh, also known as the square root function um, we solve. Um, one thing we'll do with these functions, well, we'll do a lot with these functions. One thing will be to discuss their domains. Um, the domain is all x values you can put into a function and get, or well, and evaluate it to a y value. Um, so this, uh, I'm gonna write this as a remark. And I guess it's technically a theorem in that. Um, but I'll leave it as a remark because remark. What's the domain? The first one we talked about was a polynomial. The domain of a polynomial is what? Well, polynomial, and you know, we just have x to certain whole numbers. We can put any x value in for that. Any real x value in for that. The domain of a polynomial, the set of x values you can put in is all x values, which we'll write as negative infinity to positive infinity. Let's make this a bullet list. So a polynomial, we can put any x value we want into it and it'll evaluate to you know, some other number. How about the domain of a rational function? Well, what can go wrong with a rational with substituting into a rational function? You substitute up here, you substitute down here, both of them are going to evaluate by the first bullet point since they're polynomials. But this is a fraction. A fraction will not evaluate when the bottom equals zero. Um, so the domain of a rational function is all x values except where the bottom equals zero. Um, and I'll, I'll write that like this with a set. Um, in the example we do in a moment, um, I'm gonna use intervals, but here just for definition, I'm gonna use the set the set of all x values such that um, a large vertical bar in math is read such that. The set of all x such that the bottom doesn't equal zero. That's a bad end of a curly bracket. These are sentences. So if we're finding the domain of a rational function, what we need to do is figure out where the bottom equals zero, because those are not going to be in our domain. Now, what about a root function? Well, any questions about the first two parts of that remark? So what about the domain of a root function? Well, the domain of a root function has to be split into two cases. Why? Well, just take n equals two, n equals three, the square root and the cube root. What is the square root of a positive number? Well, it's some other positive number. What is the square root, or sorry, the cube root of a positive number? It's some positive number. What about negative numbers? What's the square root of a negative number? Well, the square root of a negative number is not defined on the real number line. But the cube root of a negative number is defined because, for example, negative one cubed is negative one. So 
these root functions are going to have different domains based on uh, whether n is even or odd. So let's write that down. Uh, I like how I phrased it in my notes. What did I say in my notes? Um, if n is, let's do even first, even, then the domain of f of x equals x to the one over n, which is showing up on the screen. But f of x equals x to the one over n is what? Well, it's a set of x such that x is greater than or equal to zero. Because zero times zero is zero. Zero times zero times zero times zero is zero. But if we have an even root function, then what's inside the root must be positive or zero. In particular, it can't be negative. But if n is odd, since a negative cubed, a negative to the fifth, a negative to the seventh, and so on, is still negative, if n is odd, the domain is everything. The domain of x equals x to the one over n is all real numbers. Um, for these domains, I am always going to write them in interval notation, except in this remark, um, just because it's easier to specify the x's for the uh, domain description. Um, any, well, any questions about that remark before we do an example? Well, two examples. Well, actually, let's do one example, something else, and then another example. Example. Find a domain of this function uh, for, actually, we can do, okay, let's do this and then the other thing. 4x minus 5 over x squared plus 5x plus 6. Find this domain. Well, first we observe this is of the form polynomial over polynomial. So its domain will be everything except where the bottom equals 0. So let's find where the bottom equals 0. Uh, find where the bottom equals zero. Uh, do that here. x squared plus 5x plus 6 equals zero. Does it factor? Well, it does factor. If I ask it, it's going to factor because I don't like the quadratic formula and I don't like completing the square. Does this factor? Well, what do we need? We need what numbers that multiply to 6 and add to 5. 2 and 3 make 6. Two and three make five. So that factoring works. Solve this. What do we get? We get x equals negative two. And we get x equals negative three. So we have found where the denominator equals zero. This question doesn't say find where the denominator equals zero. It says find the domain. So the domain is everything except these values. We take the entire real number line. We jump around negative two and, ne and negative three. So let's write a little more over here so it fits. Up over negative three, up over negative two, 
and that gives us our domain. To anticipate a question, if you did want to write it as a set, I, I guess that would be okay. That would take off for it. If you wrote it as the set of all x, such that x is equal to negative three, two or negative three, that's what it's. Um, any questions about that example? Okay. Um, we found the domain. We can also find the roots, I guess. I didn't ask that in the direction. So what about the roots of f of x? Well, if we want the roots of f of x, we need where f of x equals 0. So let's solve this function. That's not going to fit here. OK, I'll, I'll write it here. We want to solve this function, or this equation, sorry. A root of f of x is where f of x equals 0. We want to set f of x equal to 0 and solve for x. How can we solve this? Well, how can we solve this? How would you solve a different function? How would you solve, I don't know. How would you solve this equation for x? x over 2 equals 7. Well, you'd want to isolate x. How would you isolate x? You need to get rid of this 2 over here. That 2 is in the way. How do we get rid of that 2? Multiply by it so that that goes away. We get x equals 14. So can we do that here? Well, we can. We can multiply both sides by that entire denominator. Multiply the left side by the denominator. What do you get? Left side times denominator. It's just the numerator. The denominator divided by itself is 1. Multiply the left side by the denominator. You get this. Multiply the right side by the denominator. You get 0 times the denominator which is zero. Solve this for x, what do you get? You get x equals 5 quarters, add 5, divide by 4. Um, so that, that question I could have said, find the domain and the roots, I think. I probably said that on the worksheet. Yeah. Um, so notice the roots of a rational function will occur where the top equals equals uh, zero by that observation. I'll leave it at that, but, well, yeah, okay. Any questions about that one? Okay. Um, let's define one other thing and then do another example, and then we will start our discussion on trig. So we have discussed lines, quadratic functions, polynomials, rational functions, root functions. Those functions are all a subset of a larger set of functions called the algebraic functions. Definition. The or an, I should say. This is in general. An algebraic function is one which can be written with the algebraic um, operations involves shorter word on this one which can be written with involves the algebraic functions or uh, operations positive negative multiplication division an algebraic 
function involves those, but it also involves rational powers. And roots. Oh, oh, I should say pawn on. I didn't write pawn on that, did I? Eh, sorry if you already wrote this. An algebraic function involves those polynomials, rational powers, and roots. And you could compose the functions too, um, but an algebraic function. You know, it'll involve the algebraic property or operations, but it also can have you know a, a power like x to the seven fifths, um, x to the one hundred third, something like that. It's still an algebraic function, um, but something like sine of x, for example, something like two to the x, those are not algebraic functions. Um, Oh, I did underline. So I'll also say a transcendental function. Transcendental. A transcendental function cannot be written. With these operations, I'll just say it like that. With we have all functions are now divided into two sets of functions: algebraic functions and transcendental functions. Um, examples of, tran of uh, transcendental functions and you know, the trig functions, which we're going to talk more about in a moment. Uh, exponential functions, logarithm functions, um, anything that can be written algebraically. Um, well, I'm never going to ask you about those two words. I'm not that good with words, so no, I, I don't want you to have to worry about remembering words. But you know, we're, we are going to see examples you know, every class of um, both kinds of functions. Um, so this function here, f of x equals the square root of 16 minus x squared. That is an algebraic function. Rational powers, roots, either one you want to think of here, x to the one half, but it also has a polynomial inside. So this function involves polynomials, roots, and some of the operations, which make it, which makes it an algebraic function. Here we want to find its domain. Well, from the previous remark, we know the domain of a root function is where what's inside the root. This here is a, a square root, meaning it's a root function with n equal to. So the domain of this function will be wherever what's inside the square root is greater than or equal to zero. So we want where we want the x values where what's inside the square root greater than or equal to zero. Well, add x squared, you get x squared less than or equal to 16. Which x values are these? Well, x values between four and negative four, including four and negative four, because it could be equal. And if you wanted to write this as a, an interval, which you can if you want, I want, so I can. You can write that as the interval negative four to four, uh, including the intervals. Oh, why did you flip the sign when you added x squared? Um, when you add x squared, you get 16 is greater than or equal to x squared. So I just 
wrote that in the other direction. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I, I always, for these, I always like when the X's are over on that side. Um, any other questions about this one? Um, so we discussed um, a lot of different kinds of functions, all of which are algebraic functions. Let's talk a little bit about the about some other functions. Um, on Canvas, just the maybe a half hour before our meeting, I posted two other documents. Um, so I, I'd like you to open one of them because I am going to kind of follow along. One of them, where's the camera? It's all the way over there. One of the, yeah, you can't see that one. Uh, one of them is called trigonometry and it looks like this. Um, so I'd like you to open that because um, I'm going to reference that. Uh, it's in the week one module and the, uh, it's called trigonometry. I didn't email it to you. Um, but it is posted. I will email it later. Um, there are, well, let's erase this. There are many things we can say about trigonometry. There are many ways we can discuss trigonometry. Um, we will see trigonometry frequently in this class. It will largely involve evaluating trig functions at certain angles. So let's discuss the angles first. Um, Let's discuss the angles first. You're probably used to an angle measurement in terms of degrees. We aren't going to use that in calculus. What are we going to use instead? Well, uh, well First, let's draw the unit circle. A circle, radius one, um, centered at the origin. So here we have unit circle, center is the origin, radius is one. We're gonna pick a point on this circle. I'm gonna pick it in the first quadrant. And right here, this wedge defines an angle. An angle from the positive x-axis up to uh, where we picked our point, which for this example, or for this illustration is up here, first quadrant. Now that does define an angle in terms of a number of degrees, but Degrees are not the most convenient way of interpreting angles for many, for many parts of Calc 1, for many parts of Calc 3, um, some parts of Calc 2. Um, but a degree measurement frequently gets in the way. And because of that, we have another way of interpreting an angle where we're technically not even thinking about the angle, we're just thinking about the length of the part of the unit circle chopped off by that angle. Now, the unit circle has radius one. What we're going to do here is equate this angle to that piece of the unit circle that is chopped off. How can we do that? Well, let's just write it like this. Um, 
that piece of the unit circle from here to here is going to give us another interpretation of the angle called the radian. So let's say this piece of the unit circle has length, let's just say length in radians. We're to find radians. Now, how can we find a radian length? How can we find this length? Well, we're using a unit circle for convenience. Well, it's standard, and it's standard because it's convenient. There are, there is a measure on the unit circle that we can find. There's a measure on the outside of the unit circle that we can find. Meaning, if we take this angle and go all the way around, we can find the radian measurement, which is just the circumference of the unit circle. We can also find the uh, angle going all the way around. So how, to, how do we find the radius? Let's to find a conversion, but well, maybe I'll say to find a relation. That's better than conversion for right now. Find a relation between that degree measurement and a radian measurement. The radian, to be completely technical, is a length on a unit circle. Now, for all practical, for all practical purposes, you can interpret it as an angle. But those two quantities are related. To find a relation between degrees and radians. We well, I'll say to find the relation. Let's make the observation up here. For 360 degrees, a degree measurement, that's the entire angle, the entire piece of the units, or the, uh, yeah, the entire unit circle. Well, the angle is 360 degrees. What is the circumference of a unit circle? Well, the circumference of a circle is what? 2 pi times the radius equals circumference. Well, if the circumference is 1, or sorry, if the radius is 1, then the circumference is just 2 pi. So to define the radian, we want the angle to correspond to a circumference, or a piece of the circumference. I guess I don't need the word for. I was going to turn that into a sentence, but I guess we don't need to. We will equate all the way around the circle to all the way around the circle. The degree measurement going around the circle, 360. The arc length measurement going around the circle is the circumference. Radius one tells us the circumference is two pi. So an angle measurement can now be interpreted as a piece of the unit circle. We will use that interpretation you know, every time we see these. Now, 360 and two pi, now this conversion can be reduced you know, because both sides have a two. Divide both sides by two. by both sides by two, you get 180 degrees, is pi radians. And this gives us a way to convert uh, between angles and degrees. Any, any questions about that? So let's, um, well, let's use it, I'm gonna use it more. So there are going to be 
some parts of trig I jump over because they're not particularly important for what we're going to use it. You know, trigonometry in high school it can be extended across several months. Um, so we aren't going to use all of it. All that we will use is contained on this page. So in the middle left of that page, we have that conversion between degrees and radians. So what else will we use? Well, did I draw that on this? Degree, the angles in consideration are always going to be starting at the positive x-axis and going in the counterclockwise direction for positive degrees. So what is this angle? Well, this angle is 90 degrees. Well, that is 90 degrees. What is that in radians? How do we convert degrees to radians? Well, we use our unit conversion. 90 degrees into radians. Well, how do unit conversions work? Well, they work because we can multiply and divide if we keep our units um, organized. 90 degrees converting to radians. We have this relation, degrees and radians. Divide by, you divide by degrees, degrees will cancel. Multiply by radians, RAT. The units are now going to be converted into radians. Degrees cancel, you're left with radians. 9 divided by 18 is a half. So 90 degrees corresponds to a piece of the unit circle of length pi over 2. So we're going to consider that 90 degree angle as pi over 2. Any questions about that conversion? Um, notice over here in that drawing, I didn't write radians. Um, this will probably be the last time I write radians outside of a conversion. What about this angle? The angle defined on that straight line. Well, we know it's degree measure. It's degree measure, the, de the uh, degrees of a straight line, or maybe I should say degrees on a straight line. 108, convert that to radians. Well, we have the same conversion, pi radians for 180 degrees. Degrees cancel, you're left with radians. 180 divided by itself is one. So this, all the way over there, corresponds to an arc of length pi on the unit circle, meaning we can associate 180 degrees to pi radians. What if we went further? What if we went down to here? Three quarters of the way around a circle. It's 270 degrees. Convert that into radians. 270 divided by 180. Well, 27 over 18. They both have nine, so what is that? Three over two. So three halves pi radians down here. Now, what if we went all the way around? Well, we already know if we go all the way around, that's 360 degrees, but it's also two pi radians. But what we are considering here is a point on the unit circle corresponding to an angle measure. So if you wanted to wind up at this point on the unit circle, you could have gone around once, or you could have not gone anywhere. You could have gone zero degrees. So by these definitions, well, by standard definitions, which are these, this point on the unit circle is defined in multiple ways. Angle zero, but you can also go around the circle once. You can also go around the circle twice and get there. 
correspond to another two pi. Um, more on that in a moment. Any questions about that uh, labeling over there? So we haven't discussed anything about the trig functions yet. We've just discussed uh, uh, angle measurements in terms of piece of the unit circle. What about the trig functions? Well, there are six trig functions. Um, I, I guess I can get rid of this drawing for now. I am going to come back to a similar drawing. There are six trig functions, and they're all defined by looking at an angle in a right triangle. We'll call that angle theta, Greek letter theta. That angle, well, this triangle has three sides. This side we'll call the adjacent. Adjacent, A-D-G-A-C-E-N-T, large capital A. This side is the side next to that angle, which is not the hypotenuse. You up here, hypotenuse. large capital H. This other side on the opposite side of that angle will be the opposite, large capital O. And the six trig functions take as an input an angle and throw out as an output some ratio of these sides. And at the top of the trig page, um, we have the six trig functions. There's a way of remembering them. Um, six trig functions right here. So on that diagram, I don't write out the words opposite of JSON and Um Those are a lot of letters. So we'll just write them as O, A, and H. But the six trig functions are defined in terms of these. The first one, sine. Sine takes an angle, and its output is O over H, the opposite side length over the hypotenuse. Next one is cosine. A over H, adjacent side over hypotenuse. Tangent, the third one. Sine technically spelled S I N E, um, just abbreviate the three letters. Cosine, C O S I N E. Tangent, T A N G E N T. Tangent is defined in two different ways, technically. There's one in terms of these uh, side, sides of the triangle, but it's also defined in terms of sine and cosine. So I'll write both of the definitions. First, we have opposite side over adjacent side. But tangent could also be written as the sine over the cosine. Um, throughout the semester, we'll use um, both of those interpretations of tangent. And notice sine divided by cosine does equal opposite over adjacent, because the hypotenuse is canceled. Um, so right here, we have three trig functions. The other three trig, trig functions are these three flipped around. First, cosecant, C-O-S-E-C-A-N-T, abbreviated C-S-C. Cosecant is sine flipped around. And in that document, I did write sine flipped around, one over sine theta. Here, I'll just write it in terms of the triangle. The secant, S-E-C-A-N-T, abbreviated S-E-C, is cosine flipped around. And if you want more technical language, it's the reciprocal of cosine. And cotangent, abbreviated C-O-T, is tangent flipped around, reciprocal of tangent. And the cotangent 
if you flip the sines and cosines around, could also be written as cosine of theta over sine of theta. Any questions about defining six functions? We've defined six functions in terms of a triangle. Any questions about that? Now, how does this all relate to the initial discussion about the radian measurements? Well, it relates because these triangles show up in the, the unit circle drawing. So let's do that. Let's uh, see where. Where do they show up? Well, let's see, where's the chalk I was using this one? There's a unit circle. I don't like how that looks. That actually wasn't a bad circle, but um, I want to magnify on the first quadrant. Okay, so here we have a unit circle looking more at the first quadrant than the rest. Circle of radius one. Let's uh, mark off that it's radius one. There's point one zero. There's point zero one. Right here, this point on the unit circle defines an angle. It defines which angle? Uh, I'm going to move that point, sorry. I want it more down. This point on the unit circle, no, I want this one. That'll probably look better. This point on the unit circle defines an angle. An angle defines a radian measure. But I'll just leave it as an angle for now. Remember, our angles are always going for positive angles, going up in the positive direction from the positive x-axis. Now, I don't see a right triangle, but we can make one by dropping a perpendicular down from that point. Why is that useful? Hypotenuse is one for them. In that triangle, we can define all of the trig functions using that triangle, I should say. It's a right triangle. But two of them show up exactly in this somewhere. Why? Well, let's look at, uh, for that angle, let's look at the adjacent over the hypotenuse. Now, let's not. This has ordered pair, x, y. What does that mean that has ordered pair x, y? Well, an ordered pair tells you a horizontal distance and a vertical distance. The x is the horizontal, the y is the vertical. That tells us that this x value down here, that x value, that distance is x. So I'm going to do side work. Considering that triangle only, magnifying that triangle, we have x is that x value because we've labeled this ordered pair. The y value is the height of the, well, it's the vertical distance corresponding to that order of pair. Meaning that side over there is y. Here's angle theta. So from our definitions, what is cosine of theta? What is cosine of theta? Oh, there's theta. Cosine, remember, or from here, is adjacent over hypotenuse equals adjacent over hypotenuse. The adjacent side to this angle is x. The hypotenuse opposite the right angle is 1. Adjacent over hypotenuse. Adjacent is x, hypotenuse is 1, 
that fraction reduces to x. So in this unit circle, the x value is actually the cosine of that angle. So this x distance is the cosine of that angle. Any questions about that? What about the sine? What's the sine of that angle? Well, the sine of this angle, remember, sine is opposite over hypotenuse. The opposite side is y. The hypotenuse is 1. y over 1 equals y. So that tells us that this y value is actually the sine of that angle. And I'll write that like this. That's a lot of arrows, but. Why I drew pretty large. So the x and y values for that given ordered pair correspond to trig functions evaluated at the angle, which tells us that this ordered pair on the unit circle is actually the cosine of the angle and the sine of the angle. Any questions about that? Okay, let's do a couple examples, but let's uh, draw something first. Um, so that first, yeah, I think it was the first circle I drew. Um, I labeled a couple of radian measures on that first circle. We had pi over two, we had pi, we had three pi over two, and we had zero, but we noted that that also equaled two pi. We can use this to find, well, we can use this to evaluate trig functions at certain uh, lengths. So at certain angles, you can think of it. How can we do that? Well, we can also find these ordered pairs. Remember, on the unit circle, this is a unit, it's always, you know, I'm not always going to write that it's a unit circle, but it, every one we do will be a unit circle. The ordered pairs on this unit circle give us the cosine and the sine of the angle. Well, we can find four ordered pairs on this unit circle. This one has ordered pair what? One, zero, it's radius one. This one up here has ordered pair zero, one. This one down here has ordered pair what? Zero, negative one. And this one over here has ordered pair negative one, zero. And with that, we can do a couple examples. With that and this observation, we can do a couple examples. So let's uh, do a couple examples. Evaluate, let's do three. Evaluate sine of pi over two. Now pretty much, so we will be doing some calculus with trig functions. A lot of the calculus we do will result in our having to evaluate trig functions at uh, certain numbers, which will show up conveniently on the trigonometry page. So let's evaluate sine of pi over two. Let's do tangent of how about pi and let's do secant of uh let's do three pi 
Okay, let's do it three times. Okay, evaluate these. Sine of pi over two. Well, we have the unit circle, so we can use the unit circle. These angles, notice, will all show up somewhere on these axes. Angle pi over two. So again, that these pi quantities are technically not angles, but we can think of them in terms of angles. Now, it is useful to know in the back of your mind that that does correspond to a length on the unit circle. But for all practical purposes, you can associate the angle measurement to the radian measurement and interpret the radian measurement as an angle if you want. Pi over two brings us up there. The point on the unit circle, the X value and the Y value on the unit circle at that point, or sorry, at that angle is zero, one. The X value is the cosine of pi over two. The Y value is the sine of pi over two. So the Y value is one. Any questions about that first one? We went up here. We wanted sine, and sine is the y value. Next, tangent of pi. Well, the ordered pairs on the unit circle give us sine and cosine. They don't immediately give us tangent, but one definition of tangent is as the sine, in this case of pi, over the cosine of pi. And we can use the unit circle to find the sine and cosines of pi. Angle pi, well, radian measurement pi corresponds to angle 180, which brings us to this point over here on the unit circle. The x value is the cosine of pi, denominator is negative one. The y value is the sine of pi. Sine of pi is zero. So the tangent of pi is this fraction, which reduces to zero. Any questions about those first two? How about that third one, three pi, secant of three pi? Well, first, secant, again, we, we um, on the unit circle, we have only sines and cosines. So we can write secant, remember secant is cosine flipped around. So the secant of, uh, the secant of three pi is one over the cosine of three pi. Where's three pi? I don't see a three pi over here. Well, I do, but it's chopped in half down there. How can we figure out where on the unit circle three pi brings us? Well, we're traveling around in a circle and every length of two pi corresponds to a length of zero. Because going around the circle once is the same, well, brings us, brings you to the same point as going around the circle zero times. Meaning on the circle, length zero and length two pi lead in, on the unit circle, length zero and length two pi correspond to the same point. Meaning we can take this angle, we can remove or add two pi and it'll get us into this circle. You might have to remove it a bunch of times. Um, but here, we can remove it once. And what does that do? Well, three pi, and I guess I'll write it up here. Three pi is beyond two pi. Um, in general, it's convenient if your angle is between zero and two pi. Um, so we can use that equality. We can remove a two pi. Three minus two is one. So three pi's without two pi's leaves you with one pi. 
And that tells you on the unit circle, angle three pi leaves you at the same point as angle pi. So the cosine of three pi equals the cosine of pi. What's the cosine of pi? Well, pi brings you here, cosine is the x value. The x value, negative one, so we get one over negative one, a fraction which reduces to negative one. Any questions about uh, that example? So what we've done so far will allow us to evaluate trig functions at angles that wind up on our axes. It doesn't help us if our angle is, say, an angle like that, that brings you to the point inside one of the axes. So how can we figure those out? Well. To make some observations. Um, I'm going to jump over some of the details because the details aren't that necessary. On this trig page, middle right, there's a diagram that looks like this. And I also, yeah, I did label the axes. Um, it's convenient for many evaluation purposes. Well, I'll leave it like this for now, and then I'll label. What does this mean? Well, we have quadrant one, quadrant two, quadrant three, quadrant four. And you can remember the order here by remembering a, what a mnemonic phrase. Always, there are many of them. The one I learned was always study trig carefully. Now, what does that tell us? Well, it tells us, well, it allows us to reach some nice conclusions by remembering where to put the letters. If our angle is in the first quadrant, all trig functions evaluate to, um, they evaluate to positive numbers in the first quadrant. If the angle brings you to the second quadrant, sine evaluates to a positive. It's reciprocal, cosecant evaluates to a positive, but the others are negative, evaluate to negatives in the second quadrant. In the third quadrant, we have T, that tells us tangent and it's reciprocal cotangent evaluate to positives and the rest evaluates evaluate to negatives. In the fourth quadrant, cosine evaluates to a positive. It's reciprocal secant evaluates to a positive, and all others evaluate to a negative for the fourth quadrant. So, to figure out the sine of a trig function for an angle inside a quadrant, one thing we need to do is identify which quadrant it's in. And to do that, I like remembering. where the quadrants change. If our angle is between zero and pi over two, we're in the first quadrant. If our angle is between pi and three pi over two, we're in the third quadrant and so on. So this diagram tells us information about the sine, S-I-G-N, um, of trig functions evaluated at angles. Any questions about that diagram? I did jump over some of the details, but you know, with the um, x, y ordered pair being cosine and sine, you can derive that, for example, over here, the uh, x value is uh, what, negative, y value positive, and so on. Um, down here, x and y are both negative, so tangent, those two divided is positive, and so on. But um, I, I won't go through those details. Um, there's one more thing we need to evaluate trig functions. 
And on the page, I wrote them as two triangles. There are two convenient triangles. Ah, that's not the right chalk. There are two different kinds of chalk, and one of them is much nicer. There are two triangles, right? The first one is a pi over six, pi over three, and a right angle with sides and ratio one to root three to two. The other triangle is pi over four, pi over four, and a right angle with sides and ratio one to one to root two. And these triangles are gonna be very useful for evaluating trade functions. You'll see throughout the semester, I draw these triangles on, on the side of my work all the time. Um, you may have seen these, but we probably did see them before in their angle, in their degree measures. You know, this one is a 30, 60, 90 triangle. And you can do the unit conversions to get from 30 to pi over six. This one's, you know, 45, 45, 90. Versions. Um, but we're going to use those to uh, evaluate trig functions. And we'll, well, it's that clock says 259. Um, so tomorrow at one, we'll start by evaluating trig functions. Um, and you'll see that all we really need to do that are these two triangles, this diagram, and uh, the unit circle. Um, any questions? Um, Um, so I will hold an office hour from three to four. I'll send you a link in a moment. I'm going to hold it in my office instead of this classroom. Um, so if you have any questions, you can you know, stop in for that and ask questions. If not, uh, enjoy your day. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.